Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome from Amsterdam to this second webinar of Project Awesome. It's so great to see many of you back again and to see many new names of friends and colleagues who've, whose work we admire. We see that more participants are joining in. Welcome to those of you who've just joined us. It's great to have you all with us. What to expect in this webinar? We will start telling you more about how to set up an experience sampling study, and in particular, an ESM study that allows of N is one methods of analysis. These are methods that allow us to investigate the effects of social media use on each single person. ESM is an intriguing research design. I've become a great fan of it. It allows you to get a thoughtful snapshot of adolescents' daily life while still fully respecting their privacy. And it's also a great method to circumvent a well-known plague in survey methods we call bias. Our N is one approach has rarely been applied in communication. But it is, in fact, very old. Until the 1930s, social science findings were typically presented as a series of individual cases. And many famous theories originate from an NS1 approach. Think of Freud, think of Darwin, and think of Piaget, who formed his amazingly sophisticated cognitive developmental theory based on NS1 observation among his own children and grandchildren. And even today, Qualitative research among single cases has greatly contributed to our understanding of the striking differences in adolescents' responses to media. And of course, you can ask, if many of our theories have qualitative origins, why don't we all just go for qualitative research? The answer is simple. Some of us simply want to compute p-values, b-factors and confidence intervals when generalizing from n is one observation and investigating theories. And today we will show you our way to do so. But before we start, we need to share some practical notes. And so therefore, I will turn over the screen to Luz Keizers. Luz is a professor at Erasmus University Rotterdam and a member of Team Awesome. And today she acts as our moderator. Luz. Thank you, Patti. Hello to you all around the world. It's a pleasure that uh, you're here today with us on our awesome series webinar. Today we'll have three presentations and it's followed by Joe Walter's discussion. And after his discussion at 5.45, we'll have a Q&A session. And here's where I need your help. So throughout the webinar, whenever you have a question, when it boils up, please do use the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen, where you can add all your questions to the presenters. And if you do so, please indicate two things. First of all, your name and affiliation, so we know who the question is asked by, and also for whom the question is. A small note, it might be that if we find your question really interesting, that we want to bring you live on screen during our Q&A session. So please make sure you do look appropriate if we do so and if you turn your camera on. At the end, you'll be able to find the recordings of this webinar at our website. And there you also find the recordings of the last um, uh, autumn webinar. So if you're interested in looking back at the first version, you're also invited. Let's uh, get started and uh, go to the first presentation. Thank you very much once again for being here. Okay, thank you, Luz. On to the presenters of today. I'm going to introduce the three speakers when they start their presentations. For now, I'd like to extend a very special welcome to Professor Joe Walter, who kindly agreed to act as our discussant today. It's great to have you with us, Joe. It's very early in the morning for you, and so we all the more appreciate your presence today. On to the first presenter, Irene van Driel. Irene studied neuroscience and did her PhD 
at Indiana University. And since 2018, she has been a member of Team Awesome. Irene, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Patti. Thank you for this introduction. And indeed, welcome to uh, Joe Walter um, and everyone around the world, wherever you are at this moment. Um, I have the honor today uh, to talk you uh, through the design of Project Awesome. Um, we launched officially in uh, September of 2018 with the um, ultimate goal to study the associations of social media use with well-being on this uh, NS1 level that we have been repeatedly talking about now. So in this talk, I will share with you how we set up this study, all the steps that went into it. And um, in the end, I would like to share a few lessons learned about ESM. Of course, we've learned a lot of things. Um, so any questions that I didn't address, um, I'd love to hear at the end um, of all these presentations. So let's dive into it. Um, and it is one time series analysis for this method. We uh, need to collect ESM data to be able to do these types of analysis. So around 50 to 100 assessments per individual um, are needed to assess associations in our case of well-being and social media use at the individual level. So um, experience sampling method data. In our specific case, we did 126 assessments because we asked a lesson six times per day for three weeks long, um, how they were feeling, what types of social media use they were using. Um, and that results into graphs like these, um, where you can see the co-fluctuations of social media use, uh, in this case, in yellow, and effective well-being in blue. So 126 measurement uh, times um, across time for one individual. And we did this eventually for um, 388 lessons. So um, this, of course, didn't just come about. Um, we had a few challenges to face before we were able to um, set up this study. Um, so what kind of challenges do we have? Uh, one of them is how to develop measures that are suitable um, for ESM specifically in terms of social media. Um, you may all have experienced how hard it is to assess social media in the first place and how can you do that on ESM uh, appropriate level. Um, and um, of course, if you want to adhere at a lesson specifically um, to you uh, for 21 days, six times uh, a day, you might want to know how to optimize compliance. So how can we make it as attractive as possible to, for uh, lessons to participate um, and minimize hurdles? Um, therefore, we needed a few steps to prepare. So of course, we dove into the theory um, and methodology for the, the developing this study, but we also conducted three separate preparatory studies. Um, first of which was interviews, then we conducted a national survey, um, and finally a pilot ESM study. So I'm gonna go over them very briefly. Um, my favorite picture of uh, Luce Powell's who was getting ready to uh, conduct interviews, uh, a full day of interviews with adolescents, and where we asked on a qualitative level what social media they actually use, and with whom do they use it, and what do they call all these names, like browsing, snapping, swiping, what kind of words should we use if we design our measures. Secondly, the national survey. Um, how do these measures and findings generalize to a national representative sample? Um, and what are the most used platforms on a national level? And what are the most frequent activities um, when engaging in social media use that would actually be helpful to assess in an ESM, right? If something doesn't occur, um, hardly ever occur, it's not useful to include it in our ESM measures. So thirdly, we set up a pilot ESM to test these measures, validate the measures, um, to look at with in-person fluctuations. So is there even enough uh, fluctuations in these measures or are these more trade measures? Um, and we learned how to personalize questions. Um, and I will get back to that in a little bit. So all of this knowledge that we gained, uh, we put into this measurement first design, which was the final uh, and ultimate step for the NS1 time series analysis. So we 
uh, followed 388 lessons and had 250 um, assessments um, spread over two ESM studies. And uh, what have we learned from all of these steps and what can we share with you? So first of all, um, minimize the number of items when you conduct an ESM. Of course, this depends on a number of factors, but we have learned that 23 items um, is doable if you assess six times a day, in our case, 20 days um, in a row. We have learned that personalization of questions is important. So if somebody doesn't use Instagram, it's not useful to ask about that. So we have personalized our ESM um, to suit the type of social media used by these adolescents. Um, we have also looked at the uh, sufficient frequency of occurrence. So uh, we know that adolescents do not post on Instagram very much. So that is a reason to not include it, for example, in ESM. Uh, and we have looked at the within-person fluctuations of measures. Uh, so is, are these suitable for ESM? If not, then um, that would save you an item to include. Very important with adolescents specifically is to keep the instructions clear and simple. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time on um, giving instructions face to face so that we could explain, answer questions, um, but also to make them visual. And I'll give you a small example of something we did. So this is a random step in many instructions on how to install um, the ESM data collection app on their smartphones. And we have um, done this differently for Android and iPhone phones because all these steps are different. Um, and this way they could follow them and um, install the app even at a distance. A very important lesson we learned, and maybe the main, main, main lesson we've learned is um, if you want to reward um, a lessons for participation and motivate them is pay them money. That is, um, I guess, a very important lesson. Um, payment, uh, daily updates is what we gave to them on their individual progress. And I will show you an example in a little bit. Um, and we shared with them earnings and lottery results. So they earned a little bit of money for every survey they completed. And they were able to participate in a lottery if they completed all six um, in a row. And um, very logical, optimize your sampling scheme. When are adolescents actually available to answer the survey questions? So an example of our reward uh, and monitoring scheme. Um, this uh, website was designed by uh, our awesome team member, Tune Siebers. Um, this is where they could find if they won the lottery based on their participant number. Um, they could see how, uh, how well they did. So for example, if they had 88% participation, they received a fitting image with that. And we think that that motivated them to um, try that again. And then sampling scheme. Well, um, it's very handy to know when they actually wake up, when they go to bed, when they use their phone for the first time, for the last time. And of course there is individual variation in that as well. Um, we looked at their school rosters, the travel time from and to school, because then, of course, they can't be on their phone. Um, and we have adjusted the week and weekend schedule based on all these um, data. So before school, um, during school breaks, right after school, after dinner, and before going to bed is when we send out our six surveys distributed over day, also making sure that there is no overlap. It may be clear from this that it takes a village to conduct an ESM study, or in our case, um, an awesome team uh, in which everybody has their own research line. But what we all have in common is this NS1 approach. Um, and I guess the question is for Ina and Luz now, what can we actually do with this type of data? So first, I'll give my screen back to Patti. Thank you so much, Ine, uh, Irene, for this great introduction. Friends and colleagues, it's time to hand you over to the second presenter, Ine Bijens. Ine is an assistant professor in Oscar, and she is the media effects expert in our team. Ine, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Patti, and thank you to all of you joining us from all over the world um, for our spring webinar. 
In this presentation, I will show you novel ways of how you can investigate media effects hypotheses. And as we all know, when testing media effects hypotheses, we want to know whether the hypothesis holds or not right. That's quite obvious. But very often, we are testing the hypotheses at the level of the sample. So we actually assume that the media effect would hold for all people in the sample, or would not hold for all people in the sample. But in my talk, I will demonstrate how you can test hypotheses in a very different way, so that we can investigate for exactly how many people the hypothesis holds, and of course, for how many people the hypothesis does not hold. And in the field of social media effects, the passive social media use hypothesis has been circulating for years now. And the passive social media use hypothesis states that passive social media use or browsing social media has a negative effect on people's well-being. Why a negative effect? Well, because passive social media use stimulates social comparison and it may elicit envy, which in turn results in reduced well-being. So as I told you, we use methods that allowed us to unravel for how many adolescents of passive social media use hypothesis holds. And in this study, we looked at the effects of browsing social media on effective well-being, and we examined how many adolescents became unhappier of browsing social media. And to that end, we used NS1 time series, an NS1 time series analysis approach, which Irena already showed you. And that means that for each adolescent, we investigated a time series based on their experience sampling data. And in the experience sampling uh, method study, we measured their effective well-being six times per day. And six times per day, we measured how much time they had spent browsing social media. And this allowed us to investigate for each single adolescent whether browsing social media would lead to changes in well-being, in particular to declines in well-being. So let me show you for how many adolescents the passive social media use hypothesis was confirmed. For each single adolescent, the analyses provided us an estimate of the effect of browsing on effective well-being, so a person-specific effect. And here you can see the distribution of the person-specific effect sizes across all participants. And look at the green bars at the left. These are the effect sizes that pointed at the negative effect of browsing on well-being. So the effect sizes that were consistent with the passive social media use hypothesis. And these bars represent 20% of the adolescents. So the passive social media use hypothesis was confirmed for one in five adolescents. But look at the gray bars at the right. These are the effect sizes that were inconsistent with the hypothesis. So we found that the passive social media use hypothesis was rejected for 80%. And these are adolescents who did not match the hypothesis. So for 63% of the adolescent, browsing social media use did not change well-being. And for 17% of adolescents, the effect of browsing was exactly the opposite of what we would expect based on the hypothesis. So these adolescents became happier when browsing social media. So the passive social media use hypothesis does not hold for all adolescents. But of course, we wanted to know why. Why is the hypothesis confirmed only for one in five adolescents, right? And why is it not confirmed for 80% of adolescents? So um, in other words, who are the adolescents for whom the hypothesis is confirmed and who experience a negative effect? Can this be explained by Envy, for instance, as researchers argue, do the adolescents for whom browsing leads to declines in well-being experience more envy than other adolescents? Or can we explain the differences by inspiration, as others think, or maybe enjoyment? Perhaps adolescents who respond to browsing in exactly the opposite way and who become happier of browsing or inspired or experience more enjoyment. And therefore, we looked at the role of envy, inspiration, and enjoyment. And in this talk, I will focus on envy in particular. So we measured MV six times per day in the experience sampling study for three consecutive weeks. So that is more than 120 measurement moments, as Irene told you. So for each adolescent, we had a measure of his or her average level of MV across the three weeks. And this way, we could look at whether adolescents who experienced more MV than other adolescents were more likely to experience a negative effect of browsing on well-being.
but we did not find any effect. We did not find anything at all. So the trade like measure of MV did not explain for whom the passive social media use hypothesis holds and who experiences a negative effect due to browsing social media. But of course, another question we had was, how many adolescents who experienced envy due to their passive social media use experienced a decline in their well-being? And therefore, we looked at the adolescents who experienced social media-induced envy, and we unraveled how many of them eventually experienced a decline in their well-being when browsing social media. And we investigated this using an N is one moderation analysis. First, we looked at how many adolescents became envious due to their passive social media use. And we found that more than half of the adolescents felt more envious as they spent more time browsing social media. And their effect sizes are reflected in the green bars. And 44% did not experience that envy due to browsing social media. And then we examined how many adolescents among those experienced social media induced envy experienced a negative effect on their well-being due to their passive social media use. And we found that 25% of them experienced such negative effect and 75% did not. And when you look at the adolescents who did not experience social media induced envy, you can see that the pattern is a bit different. Among these adolescents, 13% experienced a negative effect and 87% did not experience a negative effect. So what are we to do with this? First, in terms of theoretical relevance, the person-specific approach allows us to demonstrate how many people really respond to their social media use or their media use more generally in a manner consistent with theoretical expectations. And another important advantage of the NS1 moderation approach is that it really allows us to also show that the conditions to explain these differences can differ from person to person. So not all adolescents who experience envy due to browsing social media experience a decline in well-being due to browsing social media. And Second, in terms of practical relevance, the person-specific approach really has important implications for interventions. Using traditional moderation approaches, um, we would still not know for, for whom exactly the effect would hold, right? And using the NS1 approach, we can really demonstrate which adolescents would meet or would really benefit from um, interventions. So we can really develop more targeted interventions and provide personalized advice to adolescents and their parents and families. So altogether, I hope that my talk really convinced you that the person-specific effects give us more richer inferences. But of course, I can imagine that some of you might feel uncomfortable looking at all these findings. And of course, our findings may look complicated, but media effects are complicated, right? And yeah, perhaps life is complicated. And I think it's probably fair to say that reality is messy. But the good thing is, and that's of course the message of this presentation, that we are able to show how messy reality is. And at the same time, of course, I hope that you all became enthusiastic about this N is one or this person specific, specific media effects uh, approach. So I would like to end my talk by giving you a few tips. Um, as Project Awesome, we are strongly committed to open science. So you can find our materials and the code for the person specific analyses on the open science framework. And in our publication, you can find more information as to how to conduct person specific analyses. And with these tips, I would like to end my talk and thank you again for joining us and give the mic back to Patti. Thank you, Ine, for another excellent presentation. Over to our final presenter, Luz Paols. Luz is a developmental psychologist specialized in methodology and a member of Team Awesome. Luz, I hand the screen over to you. Thank you, Patti. I will present yet another way to uh, illustrate what type of analysis you can conduct with uh, an NS1 approach. And specifically, I will um, zoom in on how you can investigate the risk at richer versus fork at richer hypothesis. 
And his focus is on the question, who benefits most from social media use in terms of friendship closeness? And based on the literature, two hypotheses have been proposed. First, the rich get richer hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that especially socially rich adolescents benefit from social media use in terms of friendship closeness, as they may use social media to uh, enrich their already existing strong relationship with friends. In contrast, the poor get richer hypothesis proposed that especially socially poor adolescents benefit from social media as they may use social media to compensate for a lack of friendship support in their daily life. And if we look at uh, findings of previous study, especially with regard to friendship closeness in adolescents, we see that the findings are quite inconsistent. Uh, some studies supported the rich get rich hypothesis, others the poor get rich hypothesis, and yet other studies didn't find any support of um, one of the hypotheses. And therefore we were wondering, how is this possible? And can we get a more nuanced uh, picture of these findings by using an NS1 approach? And by the NS1 approach that we use in this study, we paid, a special, we paid special attention to short-term versus longer-term effects. And let me show, the, um, show how our uh, design look like. First, we examined how social media use was related to adolescents' momentary friendship closeness in their daily lives. And we did that for each individual adolescent. And we were especially interested in how these within-person effects were related to adolescents' level of social richness and poorness. And we defined um, adolescents with low levels of loneliness as socially rich and adolescents with high levels of loneliness as socially poor. We were not only interested in how uh, social richness and poorness were related to the short-term effects of social media use and friendship closeness, but we were also interested in how these short-term effects were related to adolescents' longer-term development of friendship closeness. And in order to examine that question, we looked at um, the longer-term change of friendship closeness across seven bi-weekly post-ESM assessments of friendship closeness. And let's look what we have found. First, I will present the overall findings, so um, the average patterns in the data for socially rich and poor adolescents. And at short term, we found that the rich didn't get richer, but poorer after social media, as uh, the friendship closeness decreased after using social media in the previous hour. So the rich get rich hypothesis wasn't supported at short term. If you look at the findings for the poor adolescents, we also didn't find any support for the poor get rich hypothesis as their uh, momentary friendship closeness didn't depend on the level of uh, social media use with friends in the previous hour. So on average, we found quite little support that the, for that the rich get richer or the poor get richer. However, we had some striking as one findings. Specifically, if you look at the question, how many socially rich and poor adolescents get richer, we found that for 12% of the adolescents who are rich, uh, the rich get rich hypothesis was supported as compared to 28% of the poor adolescents for whom the poor get rich hypothesis was supported. So at short term, it seems like we have a winner so that uh, the poor get rich hypothesis uh, received the most support. It also means that there were quite a lot of adolescents for whom these hypotheses didn't hold. Often we even found that those adolescents got poorer instead of richer over time. Then we were interested in to what extent these short-term effects of social media use and friendship closeness that I presented on the previous slide were related to adolescents' longer-term development of friendship closeness. So the longer term growth over the three weeks, follow, three months following upon the ESM. And what you see with the black line is that on average, adolescents' uh, mean level of friendship closeness didn't increase or decrease uh, following uh, upon the ESM. So it remained relatively stable. However, again, we found some inter-individual differences between adolescents. As the green lines show that there were some adolescents who got richer, whereas the red line shows that other adolescents got poorer over time. 
And what we were especially interested in is whether these differences in the longer term growth of adolescents could be explained by the short term effects of social media use and friendship closeness in their daily lives. And what we found is that um, we didn't find any evidence for that the short term effects were related to the longer term effects. So what, what, what does this mean? Adolescents who got richer at short term after using social media were it more likely to get richer at the longer term than adolescents who didn't get richer or even get poorer at short term. So short term and longer term effects could have an opposing sign. So let's look at the summary of the findings. Do we find more support for the rich get richer or poor get richer hypothesis? At short term, the poor get richer hypothesis received most support as it's received support among 28% of the adolescents as compared to only 12% of the adolescents who got richer after social media. However, if we combine short and longer term insights, we see that overall there is very little support for these hypotheses in um, adolescents' lives. So only uh, about five to 6% of the adolescents um, got richer at both short and longer term. So indeed, if we come back to Ines' conclusion, I think we can say that reality is nuanced and messy because first, short-term effects may differ in size and strength from longer-term effects. And both these short and longer-term effects may vary from adolescents to adolescents. So therefore, I'm wondering how could we provide adolescents a generalized advice if the reality is so nuanced and messy? I think it's quite difficult. So therefore, I think there's really a need to go for more person-specific advice. Thank you all, and now I will give the screen back to Patti. Thank you so much, Luz, for another excellent presentation. Dear friends and colleagues, it's now time to introduce our discussant, Professor Joe Walter from UC Santa Barbara. Professor Walter is a renowned scholar in communication, science, and beyond. Joe is and we can all agree on this, the father of CMC theories, the father of communication, computer-mediated communication theories. Joe's article on his hyperpersonal communication model has been cited over 6,000 times since it appeared in 1996, and it has always been a great guiding theory for our social media research. So, as you can imagine, we are all incredibly honored to have you with us, Joe, and to hear your thoughts on our presentations. Joe, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Patty, and thank you to all of the awesome team for inviting me to respond to your research today. I, I, I'm very honored to be here. I've always looked at Patty Falkenberg as a great teacher to me. I learned so much from her thinking and from her research. When I first started working with Patty, she explained to me that Dutch people are very blunt in their comments and criticisms. I have never noticed this with Patty, either because Patty is particularly charming or I am so blunt that I cannot tell the difference. But either way, uh, it's fun to argue and engage with Patty as it is all her colleagues and associates. I, I want to begin uh, responding to today's presentations and the presentation from the last webinar by the observation that great research methods open doors to things that we have not seen before, ways that we have not seen them in the past. So research methods open doors, but I think theories are the flashlights or the torches that we use to help us find what we're looking for behind those doors. So I want to offer some reflection on method and theory and how this wonderful new research can inspire us to think and to do more. In terms of methodology, the the N equals one awesome methodology may offer us some wonderful new doors to open to see how social media affect young people or how social media affect people in general. And I wanna to prove to you that that is true, ironically, for a moment by arguing the opposite. Let me argue hypothetically that the experience sampling methods of repeated measures about individuals as they browse social media and including the focused questions about whether respondents' last experience made them happy or sadder, more envious or less envious. Let me say for a moment that this is not a method for studying social media. 
It's a method for studying any media or maybe for studying anything. One could use these, these methods uh, and operationalize social media uh, in terms of consumption, media consumption. And so far that would not differentiate it from how individuals respond to television. It, in a way it would naturally differentiate social media from going out window shopping. We call window shopping, looking in the stores to see what's there. So when I go downtown and I look in the stores and I might see whether the furnishings and the clothes that are on display make me happy that summer is coming and I can get a new wardrobe. Maybe they make me envious that I cannot afford what other people have. Or maybe, maybe I get sad that the most stylish clothes don't fit me on account of the 25 pounds in COVID weight that I have put on over the last year. And so it's great to have a research tool that can assess the changes in my affect and the changes in my well-being and the happiness I experience due to exposure to different things as I live my life. And of course, we will find individual differences among people because people, different people lead different lives. But what would a method look like that was harnessed to specific particularities and attributes, or we could say affordances of social media? Well, to answer that question and to make such a harnessing, then you have to ask, of course, what are social media? And there can be many answers, that is many aspects of social media you could capture. You could ask your respondents to focus on a particular aspect of particular interest. You could ask them uh, when you last commented on someone's status update, how did you feel? When you last read a news story that someone else shared, how do you feel? When you last retweeted something, or you can ask what's the last thing you did, whatever it was, and, and gather their responses and now triangulate their responses to the activity or to the content and so forth. Now to make those decisions, you'll need a theory, a theory to guide what you ask your participants to report or a theory to guide your analysis of what they do report. And here's where theory gives you a flashlight to help you decide what you want to ask. So, so now, the, now let's turn to theory. What, what theory might intersect with such a method? method? And, and the great thing is that any theory will do. It could be a theory of in individual differences and it would not be hard to find individual differences that relate. Uh, but of course there's individual differences relate to TV watching or clothes shopping as well. What if we look beyond individual differences for other systematic psychological and communication based influences that could define social media and social media activity. So let me give some examples. The most simple example, we could say that social media exert emotional influence as people communicate. The idea that the expressions we read from other people affect our moods and demeanor, potentially our well-being and our happiness. For instance, if, if I read that you, uh, you're posting that your dog died and you are in tears, I may feel sad. If I read, on the other hand, that you got a new puppy, I may be very happy as you seem to be happy. Now, there may be individual differences in my responses to these things. If, for instance, I myself am a cat rather than a dog. And of course, on the internet, nobody knows if you're a dog. Uh, but we can add characteristics now from sociometric theory. I might be sad to read that anybody's dog died, but I might be sadder yet if you are a close friend whose dog died. Now we are adding systematic influences and to, to how people respond to different forms of content, the emotion in those content. Uh, messages. Or, or we can test the emotional contagion hypothesis that Jeff Hancock's, uh, Jeff Hancock and his colleagues explored on a large scale in Facebook. Just being exposed to positive affect words versus negative affect words in social media messages I might read will affect my mood regardless of the content, regardless of the sociometric uh, relationship or, or the individual differences. Now, I don't suggest that this is a stronger hypothesis. What I suggest is that it's a rival hypothesis with a known empirically demonstrated small effect. Alternatively, we could test a hypothesis about interactivity and social reinforcement effects. And there is emerging qualitative and uh, some empirical research suggesting that some people who post messages on social media require a certain degree of feedback in order to feel successful. Now the feedback can be comments or it can be just be the thumbs up like or the heart-shaped favorite, depending on the platform, it could be upvotes. But to get 
no feedback can lead some people to experience effects like those of ostracism. So the thresholds for how many likes change your mood from sad to happy may be a matter of individual differences, but those differences may be evoked systematically in response to the frequency of social approval marked by likes. Likes might underlie the data, some of the data we've seen so far from Project Awesome in terms of what made somebody feel happy one time and sad another time. But this is just another rival hypothesis. It could be self-effect that drive happy or sad outcomes from social media use. And Patty Falkenberg has written brilliantly on why we might expect this to be the case. So it's not what we read, but what we write on social media that could lead us to be happy or sad, or that we self-disclose as Falkenberg and Pater found, uh, seem to be the, the text-based, seem to be active in text-based chatting that determined more or less well-being and, and friendship closeness. So now we might ask how intimately disclosive or in front of how many people do we disclose? Two factors that used to be oppositional, that we, we disclose intimately to a small number of people. Now we disclose intimately to 100 or 200 or 300 of our closest friends. Two factors that may underlie, do social media make us happy or make us sad? So let me conclude with this observation and bringing it back to contemporary social activities. You know, beginning almost a year ago in America and elsewhere in the world, we watched the video over social media many times showing the murder of George Floyd under the knee of a police officer. And it made us sad, made us incredulous, it made us angry, and it did every time we watched it. This week, we also watched video of the police officer being convicted of murder and taking away in handcuffs for a long time. And we felt relieved, jubilant, maybe in a way happy, at least that justice is beginning to be served. The point is that what we see and what we do with social media are not always a matter of individual differences. It has to do with what we're doing, what we're saying and so forth. And then whether we are black or white, authoritarian or egalitarian, victim or perpetrator, American or anti-American, surely makes a big difference in our reactions and surely the reactions to social media reflect those kinds of interaction effects of messages, their content, interactivity and feedback and individual differences. So what's so wonderful about this new research, these tools and the new ideas like those of Project Awesome is they allow us to ask and to answer the questions, why are there N equals one effects with greater clarity and precision, the kind that has eluded us in uh, our more traditional methods before. So the question I would like to leave with the panel in the context of these remarks would be what combination of theoretical processes plus attributes or affordances of social media and in combination with what individual different characteristics offers you the most exciting combination to further the wonderful research that you're doing. Thank you, Joe, for this great uh, discussion. Who is going to answer Joe's question? Ina? Yeah, sure, please. First of all, thank you so much for joining us, Joe, today. And, and a special thanks for this really great reflection on our work and on social media effects and, and media effects more generally. I'm still trying to digest um, what you said. And it's so interesting um, indeed, um, yeah, how you reflect on this and on our findings. Um, first, looking at theories. Um, indeed, I think that what we see in our project is that the person-specific media effects approach really allows you to um, test theories and theoretical expectations with greater precision, um, as you said, right? Um, but what we see is that our theories, our media effects theories, they're not replicated at the individual level. 
right? Luce nicely showed it that the rich get richer hypothesis does really not hold for that many um, adolescents. And we see it um, for other um, hypotheses as well. For instance, the passive social media use um, hypothesis. Um, so um, I think this brings us at a point where we really need to think how we should develop um, our theories. Um, and of course, our research and, and our experience sampling studies, they are theoretically based, of course, our studies are um, informed by theories, but um, yeah, we there is still a long way to go. And you talked about self effects indeed, which I really love. And, and that would be great if we could do this um, with the data that we have and with experience sampling data, because of course now we are focusing more on um, recipient effects. Um, and also in terms of self-disclosure, right? Um, is it also the case that when we, um, now we have looked at how social media use affects adolescents' well-being, but would it also be the case that um, adolescents um, at moments when their well-being is lower, when they are unhappier, will they self-disclose more, um, for instance? So I think that's also um, a nice way to um, move forward. Um, and when looking at the aspects of social media use, um, you indeed um, rightly pointed out, I, I believe, that um, likes may yeah, underlying the findings of our study, receiving likes um, is really important for adolescents. We also find this in uh, the findings of our national survey. Um, also, um, the timing of receiving likes is really important for adolescents. Um, but what is really a challenge is how we can measure this. I think as um, media effects scholars, we really need to think how can we measure this and implement this in experience sampling studies, for instance. In our project, we really try to measure feedback, for instance, um, how they respond to feedback, like in the moment. But um, yeah, speaking in pragmatical terms, it's really difficult to measure feedback six times per day in an experience sampling study, right? Um, so I think that's a challenge um, too. Um, also, um, I really love what you said. You really want to know how do people feel when a certain person posts something on social media or when a certain person sees a specific post on his Instagram account or gets a specific reply on social media and you really want to measure this in the moment but I think this also um, comes with certain challenges because for this person specific approach you of course um, need a lot of measurements so I think there's really a challenge for for us how can we really measure um, things like that? And then um, speaking about um, content, social media aspects more um, generally, um, um, yeah, I, it, it's probably a straightforward answer, right? We really want to know how different people respond to different content and we need to delve into the content more. Um, and that's also what we try to do with our project. So for instance, we looked at the um, effects of active use versus passive use, but we see that um, they yield so similar effects. We see that adolescents who experience a positive effect of active use also experience a positive effect of passive use. Um, so that's a nice, um, the person specific approach is really a nice way to look at that too. Um, so we see actually that we may need to challenge the active passive dichotomy, I believe, because it, it seems not to work and they are also very highly correlated. Um, other things we might think of, we have looked at the valence of um, social media use. So we see that um, adolescents have mostly positive experiences on social uh, media use, uh, on social media, sorry, which is of course awesome. Um, but again, that's so different to measure in self-reports. So I think we're left with a lot of challenges, both looking at how we can measure the content, um, how we can measure feedback and likes, for instance, um, really in the moment, but also what I really loved about your, your, your reflection is how we can further develop our theories. So I hope this answer is satisfying. Then I uh, just want to thank you once again for your kind and thoughtful reaction. And unfortunately, we are not able to offer you flowers or, pres or a present, but we can at least give you a proper round of applause. And we have found a way to do so. And we have um, decided that we 
want to make a habit of that. Dear friends and colleagues, let's give Joe a nice round of applause from your home and then I will take care of the sound. You have cured my ostracism, Patty. Thank you. Thank you very Am much. Am I muted? Uh, I was muted. I was mute. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I, the applause was great, Joe. I, but I was the only one who heard it. Okay, I'm sorry about this. Okay, guys, it's time to Q&A. It's time for discussion. Questions have been stacking up, so we'll pull out a couple of them. Luz, are you ready to handle the first question? Definitely. Thank you very much, Patti, and thank you, Joe, for your wonderful discussion of our work. There have been several questions, and we tried already to answer some of them uh, through typing an answer, but Several of the questions uh, regarding uh, were regarding the software that we used for collecting the data, but also the type of analysis that we used. And um, I'm actually uh, happy to say that we have some experts on the methods that we used in-house today. Uh, ben Guten, the founder of M+, and also Ella Haamaker, one of the developers of the time series models. But I would like actually to ask uh, maybe Ina or Luz to say a bit more about the analytical approach that you took uh, so how did you obtain these results? And Bengt and Ella, if you feel that we say it wrong, this is a good moment to step up and step in and correct us. <laughs> I can answer the question. Um, our uh, work, we uh, use dynamic structural equation modeling, and it's a uh, statistical approach that combines three types of methods. So first, the NS1 time series analysis, which you can uh, use to obtain poor specific effect sizes, but also uh, multi-level analysis, in which you can disentangle within person from between person effects. And third, it also integrates structural equation modeling, which uh, provides you a lot of flexibility, for example, to um, combine multiple outcome measures. And I can also say that in all of uh, our uh, studies that we present today, we also controlled for uh, previous levels of the outcome uh, measure, for example, previous levels of well-being at the previous assessment. So, um, yeah, to approach uh, more uh, causality-like uh, paradigm. Thank you very much, Luz. Uh, we also have an interesting question from Sonja Oots from Leipzig Institute for Recent Median, and I hope I pronounced this well. Uh, Sonja, do you, would you like to uh, um, ask your question live, or shall I um, uh, read it out loud for you? Let me see if I can get you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have put you, so you are allowed to talk now, Sonia. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a bit related to Joe's question, but on a much more concrete um, level, because I mean, now you find for some participants, you find an effect and for others, you don't. And of course, the most interesting thing would be, is this completely random or can you explain it? And so I was wondering whether you gave them in the beginning a larger survey where you have, for example, trade envy or extraversion, self-esteem or, or whatever measure you think might make sense. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, uh, what I did in, uh, in our case, but also what we did for a larger project, is that we had uh, two uh, pre ESM surveys, we call them a kind of baseline measure for e before each ESM, in which we uh, examine more trade like measures. And also in some of the bi weekly surveys that we uh, examined every one or two weeks, we also measure some trade constructs. And uh, we're currently indeed uh, doing different analysis which we relate trade like um, constructs to uh, the person specific effects. Does that answer your question? 
I mean, the concrete results would be interesting as well, but I guess it will be too complicated for a two minute answer. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for, uh, for answer, uh, asking your question uh, live. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, Sandra Calvert uh, from Georgetown University wondered um, for Patti whether uh, maybe we have considered uh, interventions and whether maybe behavioral approaches such as AB, AB reversal designs or multiple baseline designs. Um, whether we've done things like that. And I'm going to try to find you, Sandra, in case you would like to personally ask the question. And you're allowed to talk now. Sandy? Sandy, you are muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, and Patty, I did hear your, your clapping thing just to oh, let you know. Oh, that is that. wonderful. That's wonderful. So, um, you, uh, you, Luce, you just described the question accurately. It seems like Skinnerian sorts of approaches. Some of this stuff looks like it calls out for interventions, but ABAB reversal designs, multiple baselines. I wonder if you've considered any of, of integrating any of those kinds of approaches. And Patty, you know, you might know this or someone else can pick it up. Thank you. I will hand the question to Luz Power. Uh, thank you for I, your I question. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Oh, um, Luz Power, she said, because you, uh, I think, I can answer your question. I think it's very interesting to uh, conduct some intervention, but I think also first we need to know a bit more about our results. Because can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Because uh, everybody's on mute from on your end on my screen. So if you said something to me, I could not hear it. Okay. And then I will shortly answer the question for the other people and then uh, we will chat you later. Um, but um, for the uh, short term effects may differ for longer term effects. So before we can go on to interventions, I think we need to first be really sure uh, how these effects look like and how stable they are. But I think it's very interesting to um, yeah, give some personalized advice or do some uh, randomized control trials based on the findings that we have found in our studies. So uh, Luz will uh, answer your question also on the chat, uh, Sandra. So you get your personal answer if you couldn't hear her. But with that, we unfortunately, because we would have liked to spend more time with you, but unfortunately time is running out. So I would like to give the final word to Patti. Thank you, Luz. Dear friends and colleagues, we have arrived at the end of our webinar. Joe, once again, many, many thanks for your thoughtful discussion and many thanks to our colleagues, Irene, Ine, our two Luces, and last but not least, our two AV assistants, our three AV assistants, Wieneke, Tim, and Teun. As announced, the video of this webinar will go online in the next couple of days. You can also follow us on Twitter and you can find all our preprints and publications on our website. Luz will share the link in the chat. And our full webinar is planned in the fall. And finally, thanks to you, friends and colleagues, for joining us. We are hopeful to see you all back in our next webinar. So long. Adieu. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye.